Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Judiciary Lecture. Today, we will discuss the court's sources of power, growth of the court over time, jurisdiction of cases, checks and balances, and how judges make decisions. So I want to start this video off with a quick recap. We know that Congress makes the laws, the president enforces those laws, and the judiciary maintains the very special position of interpreting these laws. And the court's power of interpretation really means that the court is responsible for determining whether or not Congress or state legislatures actually have the power to write certain laws. A really good example of this from earlier in the semester was from the Supreme Court case, the United States versus Lopez. Remember, Congress had passed a law in 1990 that banned the carrying of firearms near public schools. And while this would seem like a law that everyone would be happy with, we really have an issue of federalism here. Does Congress have the constitutional authority to regulate weapons policies on school property? Well, according to the Supreme Court justices in 1995, no, Congress does not have this authority. Remember, under the 10th Amendment of the United States Constitution, states are responsible for executing their own educational policies, among a variety of other powers like regulating interstate commerce, issuing licenses, conducting elections, and so on and so forth. And the Gun-Free School Zones Act of Congress, the issue that was at the heart of this court case, was interpreted by the U.S. Supreme Court as an overreach of congressional power because the U.S. Constitution does not grant Congress the power to regulate educational policies for all of the states. So while we're on the topic of constitutional power, let's talk about which powers are expressly granted to the courts vis-a-vis -vis the Constitution. Article 3 of the United States Constitution spells out the structure, responsibilities, and qualifications of the last branch of government, the judiciary. Here's a few key facts I'd like you to know. Article 3 only creates the Supreme Court of the United States, but leaves the power to create all lower-level federal courts to Congress. And Article 2 allows the president to fill vacancies on the Supreme Court with the advice and consent of the Senate. And honestly, that's about it. You may be surprised to hear that the Constitution lists zero qualifications to become a Supreme Court justice. No age requirement, no previous job experience, no citizenship or residency requirements. In fact, you don't even have to be required to have a law degree. Moreover, the Constitution does not even state how many justices should serve on the Supreme Court. The number of justices are actually decided by Congress and the number of justices was ultimately capped at nine by Congress in 1869. But as you can see, the framers spent considerably less time hammering out the details of Article 3 regarding the judiciary than any other article in the Constitution pertaining to either Congress or the presidency. In fact, the Constitution really doesn't even grant the Supreme Court the power to overturn laws made by Congress or the states. The only thing the Constitution actually says about the Supreme Court's actual power is this. The judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. And that's it. And as you're going to see in a bit, this would later cause some significant confusion over what the Supreme Court could and could not actually do. After the Constitution was ratified in June of 1788, the new Congress met in March of 1789. One of the first pieces of legislation passed by Congress was the Judiciary Act of 1789. Remember this, this is important. It's gonna come back later in the lecture. This statute created a three-tiered federal court structure. Before reaching the Supreme Court, cases must travel through one of the 94 federal district courts spread across the country and then through one of the 13 courts of appeals. Though the number of federal courts has increased over time, this fundamental three-tiered structure has remained. The Judiciary Act of 1789 also allowed the Supreme Court the power to issue a writ of mandamus, which is basically an order issued by the Supreme Court requiring a government agency to carry out a legal duty. But again, this is going to come back later in the lecture. So remember, writ of mandamus is going to be important. The Constitution also spells out two types of Supreme Court jurisdiction that I'd like you to know. The Constitution grants the Supreme Court two types of jurisdiction, original and appellate. Original jurisdiction, which is fixed by the Constitution, 
refers to the court's ability to hear a case for the very first time. When a federal case involves two or more states, for example, the Supreme Court is the only appropriate venue for holding that trial. You can imagine that if the state of Florida was suing the state of Georgia for some reason, that Florida might not be too happy if the trial was held in the state of Georgia with all Georgia judges. In other words, there might be some potential for bias here. This is why cases involving two or more states can only be heard by the Supreme Court first. Original jurisdiction also applies to cases between the federal government and one of the 50 states, cases involving foreign ambassadors, and cases brought by citizens of one state against citizens of another state. The other type of jurisdiction is appellate jurisdiction. This refers to the court's ability to hear cases on appeal from a lower court, meaning that the case has already been tried and lower level judges have already rendered an opinion on the case. Almost all of the cases heard by the Supreme Court fall under its appellate jurisdiction. In these cases, the court only reviews the application of the law by lower federal or state courts. Frequently, these are decisions made in U.S. courts of appeals. This means that no new evidence or testimony is presented. Again, this is the most common type of case heard by the Supreme Court, so I want to go into a little bit more detail here. So, quite similar to congressional districts, each state also has a number of judicial districts that help the state organize the division of labor in hearing criminal and civil cases. And remember, each state is responsible for organizing their own court systems, so court structure varies state to state. But let's just take a look at, the, at how the court systems are organized in the state of Wisconsin. The Wisconsin court system is divided into a state supreme court, appeals court, circuit or district courts, and municipal courts. Now, within the municipal courts, which are not pictured here, there are a variety of different criminal and civil courts that each hear specific types of cases. Again, this is all to help organize the division of labor. Cases involving more serious crimes are heard at higher levels, like the state circuit court. And if the losing party of a court case wishes to appeal the ruling of the judge from a lower level, those cases are heard on appeal in the Court of Appeals or Appellate Court of the state. If the state Court of Appeals upholds the decision from a lower level, the case can then be appealed yet again to the state Supreme Court. And if you wish to appeal your case even further beyond the state Supreme Court's ruling, then you go to one of the National Court of Appeals or Circuit Courts of your area. Wisconsin, for instance, is in the Seventh Circuit. So we see this massive division of labor at the national level as well. And of course, if you are again unsatisfied with the ruling of the Seventh Circuit Court, and by this point have unlimited time and resources, uh, you may also appeal your case all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And this is a very oversimplified version of how a case makes its way all the way to the Supreme Court. But what's important to take away here is that cases first have to go all the way through the hierarchy of the state court system, the hierarchy of the federal court system, and then ultimately the Supreme Court of the United States. Today, the Supreme Court is most well known for its power to strike down laws by declaring them as unconstitutional, just like the United States versus Lopez example that we began the lecture with. But you might be surprised to learn that this incredibly important power of the courts to declare laws unconstitutional is not even mentioned in the Constitution. In fact, the court gave itself the power to declare laws unconstitutional and strike them down all the way back to 1803. And that is the significance of Marbury versus Madison. The ruling of this court case essentially gave the Supreme Court the power of judicial review, the power to declare laws unconstitutional. Now, there's a lot of really interesting facts behind this case, but I'm just going to try to stick with what's relevant for your next exam. So Thomas Jefferson, an anti-federalist, is elected to president of the United States in 1801. As President John Adams prepares to exit office, he decides he must stack the federal judges with as many Federalist judges as possible because he's afraid of what Thomas Jefferson's anti-Federalist agenda will do to the country. 
So John Adams makes all of these judgeship appointments during his final days in office, one of which pertained to the man named William Marbury, one of the key players in Marbury versus Madison. When President Thomas Jefferson took office, his Secretary of State, James Madison, refused to deliver the paperwork for several of Adams' appointments, including Marbury. And this was primarily because of strong partisan differences between the two administrations, Adams and Jefferson. Marbury took his case to the Supreme Court, which was then presided over by Chief Justice John Marshall, an appointee of President John Adams. Marbury requested that the court issue a writ of mandamus, which, remember, was a power granted to the court through the Judiciary Act of 1789, and he was requesting that the courts force the executive branch to recognize his commission. Now, while the justices believed that Marbury deserved his commission, after all, he was appointed by President John Adams, they also recognized that the Jefferson administration enjoyed overwhelming popular support and held dramatically different partisan values than the outgoing Adams administration. So the Supreme Court was reluctant to drive a wedge between itself and the executive branch so early in Jefferson's administration. So Chief Justice John Marshall has a pretty delicate political situation on his hands. Rather than simply ruling in favor of or against Marbury's complaint, a decision that would have massive political ramifications, he instead focused on the constitutional powers of the court. Now, as you recall, the only two things that the Constitution really says about the courts is that they have original and appellate jurisdiction. Now, in a somewhat stroke of genius, Marshall avoided having to pick the Federalist side or the Anti-Federalist side altogether by really breaking down the core aspects of the case of Marbury versus Madison. Marbury's case was brought to the court through its original jurisdiction, but the request to issue a writ of mandamus to the executive branch was not authorized by the Constitution itself. Remember, that was a power that Congress granted to the courts in 1789. So as Marshall viewed it, Congress was not permitted by the Constitution to adjust the court's original jurisdiction. Thus, the Supreme Court could not issue a writ of mandamus because Congress had no authority to grant such power in the first place. So while this all might not seem very significant, Marshall essentially struck down a portion of the Judiciary Act of 1789 as unconstitutional, and this was an unprecedented action of the court. And this is what we call judicial review, the court's power to review the constitutionality of laws. And what is so very special about this is that the court gave itself this power of judicial review through its ruling in Marbury versus Madison and established the Supreme Court as the final arbiter of the constitutionality of the law. So that is why Marbury versus Madison is such a significant case in American history. Remember, the decision of this case essentially granted the Supreme Court, one of its most powerful powers, judicial review, the ability to strike down laws as unconstitutional. So judicial review is a very influential power of the court. It essentially serves as a veto power against congressional legislation. But there are several ways in which the court is critically constrained. First, the courts cannot implement or execute their own decisions. This was particularly noticeable during the civil rights era of the 1950s and the 1960s when the Supreme Court ruled that segregation was unconstitutional, and yet many states continued the practice despite the court's rulings. Second, the court cannot initiate its own cases, meaning if a Supreme Court justice thinks that a law might be unconstitutional, that justice cannot act unilaterally in initiating a case against that law. Justices can pick which cases they would like to hear, but cannot initiate a case. Even if the court is eager to rule on a particular issue, it must wait until a case makes it all the way through the court system and is brought to the Supreme Court on appeal. Once the case appears in the Supreme Court's pool of cases, the justices can then select it over other cases. And remember, this is because we want our justices to be impartial, unbiased interpreters of the law, not legal vigilantes that initiate their own cases. So let's talk in a little bit more detail about how cases actually make it all the way to the Supreme Court. 
there are several structural and legal criteria that I would like you to know. First, and perhaps most obviously, there must be an actual case or controversy involving at least two parties. In other words, the controversy cannot be a hypothetical one or one that you might predict might happen in the future. Second, the parties involved must have standing. This means that the parties must have a stake in the outcome of the case and must be able to show personal or economic injury. Imagine that an environmental group wants to sue the government for destroying a wildlife habitat. Unless the group can show that its members suffered personal or economic injury as a result of the government's destruction of the habitat, the group would not have a sufficient basis for standing, since a general interest in the environment does not provide such a basis. Yet yeah, law's fun, right? Third, cases that are moot do not qualify for consideration by the court. A case is considered moot when either the conflict has already been resolved or the circumstances of the case have changed dramatically. This was actually the challenge made against the landmark abortion case Roe v. Wade. By the time the case regarding whether a Texas abortion ban was constitutional made it all the way to the Supreme Court, the woman challenging the law had already given birth, thus making the conditions of the case moot. However, courts can get around this if they determine that the circumstances of the case are so pervasive that it is likely to happen again to others. Fourth, cases that are not ripe do not qualify for consideration by the court. If a law has not yet been implemented or a discriminatory action has not yet occurred, the court will not hear a case concerning its constitutionality. This is one of the troubles with cases regarding restrictive abortion laws passed by states and something that we're actually dealing with right now in our society. Yes, we can imagine the type of harm that might be caused to individuals by enacting such strict regulations on abortion, and that might be something that we'd want to avoid altogether by having the court strike down these laws preemptively before they go into effect, but in order to legally challenge a law, you have to demonstrate with evidence that the law in fact caused personal or economic injury. So these type of cases sometimes have to unfold before they can actually be heard in court. So once all of these conditions are met, those appealing their cases must file for a writ of certiorari, which is just a fancy Latin phrase for an order to the lower court to deliver the records of the case to the Supreme Court for review. Law clerks then review the case, write memos and summaries on the cases, and present them to the justices for final review, and the Supreme Court justices decide which cases they would like to hear based upon those summaries. The Chief Justice then compiles a list known as the Discuss List on the most popular cases among the justices, and any cases that do not make it onto the Discuss List are denied certiorari. And then finally, at least four Supreme Court justices must agree to hear the case for it to be fully placed on the docket of the court. This is known as the Rule of Four. So you might be thinking to yourself, but there are nine justices on the Supreme Court, shouldn't it be five out of nine to have a simple majority rather than four out of nine? Well, the Rule of Four is a long-standing custom designed to protect the rights of the minority on the court, just like the purpose of the filibuster in the Senate. If a sizable minority of the court wishes to hear a case, the court will grant a review. So the process by which cases make it to the Supreme Court may not be as lengthy and complicated as how a bill becomes a law, but perhaps unsurprisingly, the statistics are about the same. About 1% of bills introduced to Congress actually become meaningful law, and about 1% of cases appealed to the Supreme Court are actually heard by the nine justices. Now, I'm not going to get into the details of oral arguments, but what I think is most important to take away from this process are the opinions that culminate at the end of this process. And there are three types of opinions that justices may write when making their ruling. So at the onset, one of the justices is assigned to write the court's opinion. The most senior justice who voted with the majority, who's usually the chief justice, decides who will write the majority opinion. After the opinion has been drafted, the other justices review it. Justices in the majority may agree with the opinion, but have a different rationale for why the opinion was reached. In those cases, justices may write a concurring opinion. Justices who did not vote with the majority may choose to write a dissenting opinion to express their reasons for disagreeing. 
And you might be thinking, why go through all the trouble of clarifying whether an opinion is concurring or dissenting? The justices who are writing concurring opinions still agree with the majority. So why does it matter uh, if it's for a different reason or not? Well, this is because one of the most important things the Supreme Court does is set precedent. You may have heard the Supreme Court referred to as the court of last resort, meaning that it represents the highest judicial body within a system. And one of the reasons so little cases actually make it to the Supreme Court is because there are generally enough legal similarities between relevant cases that the Supreme Court decides not to hear the case because they want to uphold the decision of other judges. But when a case actually does make it to the Supreme Court, it's usually because it is a highly unprecedented case, meaning that no case like it has been heard before. And this is why the opinions of the Supreme Court are so pivotal, because the opinions serve as legal guidelines for other judges when they inevitably hear similar cases in the future. Now, we know that no two cases are ever 100% similar, so that's why it's important for judges to clarify exactly why they agree, concur, or dissent. Let's take an entirely nonsensical scenario, for example, to help illustrate the point. Imagine a Georgia law made it illegal to engage in the activity of spittle dinking, and it doesn't matter what that is or what it means, just go with it. So the Supreme Court gets the case, hears arguments, and writes their opinions. A majority of four Supreme Court justices decide that it is unconstitutional to prohibit spittle dinking because they believe it is protected under the Constitution's Ninth Amendment to privacy. However, two Supreme Court justices concur that the law is unconstitutional, but they believe that spittle dinking should really be protected under the First Amendment's right to assembly of the Constitution. And finally, three Supreme Court justices completely dissent. States may regulate or prohibit spittle dinking because it is not mentioned in the Constitution whatsoever, thus this right belongs to the states under the Tenth Amendment. So you can see, even even with this completely nonsensical uh, argument, various judges relied on different constitutional amendments to justify their opinions. And the broader idea is that future judges will rely on these opinions to make their rulings. And perhaps in the future, a similar case arises that is a little bit more pertinent to privacy or one that is a little bit more pertinent to freedom of speech or assembly. And judges can use these opinions written by the Supreme Court to help guide their future opinions. And when we consider the universe of laws and amendments and and previous court rulings, there is a wide body of legal precedent a judge must follow when issuing their opinions. So this is why Supreme Court opinions are so important. Now, I want to shift a little bit to the topic of checks and balances now. And we've pretty much covered most of this stuff already, but I want to make sure that you know this material for the exam. As you'll remember from last week's lecture, the president exercises quite a bit of authority over the judicial branch. Remember, all federal judges are appointed by the president with the consent of the Senate. So the president has considerable power over shaping the ideology of the federal court system. This is why making those appointments um, from President John Adams when Thomas Jefferson was getting ready to take office were so critical to him. And as we've already discussed, judges hold their positions for life in order to retain political autonomy and evade bribes from politicians. Because Supreme Court justices hold their positions for life and review the constitutionality of government actions, judicial nominations can have significant long-term implications for public policy. Presidents take this responsibility very seriously and consider factors when selecting Supreme Court nominees. So there's a few critical things that presidents consider when making nominees. First, uh, they must weigh the legal experience and intellectual fortitude of political nominees. For this reason, numerous Supreme Court justices have served as federal judges and boast impressive records of legal education and experience. In fact, all nine justices of the nation's highest court have all attended Ivy League law schools at either Columbia, Yale, or Harvard. Presidents may use judicial nominations to demonstrate a commitment to diversity as well. 
They can look to qualities such as gender, religious affiliation, and ethnic background. Presidents are also likely to put forward relatively young nominees for positions on the Supreme Court, thereby influencing judicial decision-making for decades after their personal terms in office have expired. In addition, presidents weigh the ideology and judicial philosophy of prospective nominees, favoring those who have a record of upholding policies that reflect the president's own values. So if you have a president who believes in a literal interpretation of the Constitution, they're going to be more inclined to also nominate judges who share that value of a literalist interpretation of the United States Constitution. Finally, presidents must consider the likelihood of Senate confirmation of their potential nominees. Until recently, the opposition party could threaten to filibuster Supreme Court appointments, making it necessary to secure the support of at least 60 senators for a successful confirmation. But this long-standing Senate tradition changed due to political events unfolding after the death of Justice Antonin Scalia during President Obama's final year in office. So if you see uh, a question on the exam that says uh, judicial appointments are subject to filibuster in the Senate, is this true or false? That is false. There are no filibusters, um, at least for now, in the United States Senate when it comes to judicial appointments. So this is also why justices who are currently serving on the Supreme Court are strategic with their resignation. For instance, a judge who tends to make more liberal decisions would not want to retire while a conservative president was in office, as it would result in changing the liberal conservative balance on the court. And this is a big issue that gains a lot of attention uh, among political science scholars. How do, just, how do judges make decisions? Are they partisan? Uh, Are they trying to promote an agenda? So I'd like to wrap up today's lecture with what we know about how and why judges make the decisions that they do. There's four key factors that influence judicial decision making. Personal experience, judicial philosophy, political ideology, and political context. Since the first Supreme Court in our nation's history, 113 judges have served on the Supreme Court and all but six have been white men. That's more than 99%, in case you were wondering. So I think that race and gender play an inherent role in shaping our identities, as well as our worldview. So it's important to recognize that this somewhat lack of diversity on the Supreme Court, and how that might affect the quality of the opinions being rendered by that court, at least historically. Judicial philosophy also obviously plays a large part in how justices view their roles as judges. There's two major types of judicial philosophies that I'd like you to know, judicial restraint and judicial activism. According to the philosophy of judicial restraint, justices of the Supreme Court should base their decisions on the literal text of the Constitution. The intentions of the framers, as stated in the Constitution and other historical documents like the Federalist Papers and records from the Constitutional Convention, and the precedents established by the rulings of previous courts. This view maintains that social and political reforms should be left to the legislative branch and the constitutional amendment process rather than to the judicial branch. So those who practice judicial restraint call for judges to respect the rules of the other branches of the federal and state government and to refrain from invalidating federal or state law whenever possible and to respect stare decisis or the principle of deferring to precedent. By contrast, some justices believe that the court should play a more active role in instituting social and political reforms, especially by striking down laws found to be unconstitutional according to modern interpretations. So according to judicial activism, the judiciary serves as an important check and balance in the American political system. Justices who practice judicial activism tend to view the Constitution as a document that was intended to be flexible so that it could evolve along with the changing social and political conditions of our society. In a 2008 interview on 60 Minutes, Justice Ginsburg suggested that if justices were to consider solely the literal text of the Constitution and the intent of the founders, then the Constitution would still apply only to those who constituted, quote, we the people. And at the time that document was written, that referred to white property holding males. So justices who subscribe to this view heavily weigh the broader social and political implications of their decisions. 
and there's no right or wrong answer here. When we're positing these normative questions, how should judges interpret the law, I think it becomes pretty clear that different upbringings, different life experiences can have a huge impact on how you answer that question. I mean, just for the sake of argument, I think it's pretty clear historically uh, that the laws and practices of American society were, as Ginsburg points out, designed to benefit wealthy, white, privileged men. And the system has worked pretty well for those individuals. So adopting a literal interpretation of the Constitution, um, as well as the intent of the Founding Fathers, isn't so problematic for, for some. However, when we start thinking about groups of people whose rights were not always protected by the Constitution, who were marginalized, and up until just barely six, 60 years ago, uh, did not have the same rights as the rest of the population, I think it's fair to say that the Constitution, as it was originally intended to be understood, uh, should not be used as the guide that we use to help structure society today. So I think personal experience and judicial philosophy really go hand in hand. And when we understand those two things together, uh, it can shed a lot of light on understanding why justices make the decisions that they do. Political ideology is the third major factor that influences judicial decision making. So here it's important to distinguish between political ideology and judicial philosophy, where political ideology refers to one's views on the appropriate size and scope of government, judicial philosophy refers to one's views on the role that judges should play in interpreting the Constitution and the law. For instance, let's look at one of the landmark court cases regarding gun control and how political ideology and judicial philosophy interact to produce different outcomes. District of Columbia v. Heller was a 2008 case in which Washington, D.C. tried to ban the use of handguns. So we know generally that liberals support a more strict regulation of guns, while conservatives tend to oppose such regulations. So here we're talking about political ideology. What role should the government play in regulating the public's access to weapons? And let's look at how two justices, both of whom were judicial restraintists, meaning they believed in a literalist interpretation of the Constitution, were able to come to different conclusions on the constitutionality of this law. So we have Justice Scalia, a conservative restraintist, argued that Washington, D.C. did not have the authority to ban handguns because it was a violation of the Second Amendment of the Constitution, the right to bear arms. However, Justice Stevens, a liberal restraintist, argued that yes, D.C. did have the authority to ban handguns because the Second Amendment specifically says that the right to bear arms is reserved for only militias. So we see we have two justices with the same judicial philosophy, even using the same constitutional amendment as the basis of their argument, but coming to very different conclusions. And the disparity between the two can really only be explained by a divergence of political ideology. Finally, the political context or culture of society is the fourth major factor that influences judicial decision making. For example, consider the court's shift on the issue of racial segregation. After the Civil War brought an end to slavery, several state and local governments passed statutes known as Jim Crow laws that legalized strict racial segregation in public facilities and accommodations. This practice was initially challenged in the case of Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, in which the Supreme Court found that racial segregation did not violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment as long as the facilities and accommodations provided were separate but equal. This ruling furnished the moral sanction for the racial discrimination of the next 60 years, and by the 1950s, however, public sentiment concerning segregation had dramatically shifted, and the court's composition had also changed. So in the case of Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, the court declared that separate educational facilities are inherently unequal, thus overturning the court's own decision some 60 years later. The court has also been influenced by cultural change regarding homosexuality. You'll recall from earlier this semester, we discussed uh, the court case Bowers v. Hardwick in 1986, which involved a Georgia statute prohibiting sodomy. Its ruling upheld the Georgia statute and signaled that the court was unwilling to extend equal rights protections based upon sexual orientation. 
Nearly 20 years later, however, the court revisited state laws concerning sodomy in Lawrence v. Texas and reversed its position from Bowers v. Hardwick. The ruling struck down a Texas statute forbidding sodomy and invalidating similar laws across the country. And in 2015, the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage through the United States uh, in the Obergefell v. Hodges case. So these examples illustrate how shifts in our political culture are often accompanied by shifts in the position of the Supreme Court. And that's pretty much all that I have for you guys today. I tried to make this lecture short because I know you have an exam coming up. I hope you enjoyed the final lecture of this course. Please feel free to pause the video here and jot down the main recap points from today's lecture. And don't hesitate to email me if you have any questions. It's been a pleasure working with all of you this semester. I wish you the best of luck on your final exams. Stay healthy, stay safe, and as always, thank you for watching.